<clears throat> okay, so this is uh, lecture 4.2, uh, where we're talking more about vectors, quantities, and energies. Um, and in particular, we were talking about conservative forces this morning um, when we came up with um, an expression for if a force is a conservative force, then we're able to derive uh, what that force is from the potential. Remember, where the force is negative gradient of the potential. Which is a cute trick if you can pull it off. <laughs> but uh, it requires you to have a conservative force. So how do we know a force is a conservative force? Okay. So there's two conditions for a conservative force. Number one is that the potential must be a function of only position. Not a function of time, so time variable potentials are right out, or say the velocity, or something like that. So right, what works in terms of this? Clearly. Electrical forces are 1 over r squared forces, so those are cool. Uh, gravity forces are 1 over r squared forces, those work. Because it, the uh, potential only depends on position. Once you get to magnetic forces though, right, where things matter, it's Q V cross B, where things start to depend on velocity, this kind of breaks down, okay? So this doesn't always work. This is really useful if it does work, um, but you can't always guarantee. And then the other condition is that for any two points, the work done between them is path independent. By path independent, I mean not what we showed this morning where we had that freaky force where it depended on which direction we got there. We got different answers all the time. What a mess. Okay. So how can you possibly show that all different possible paths between all different possible points are going to yield the same answer? That's crazy. You can't possibly prove that. Okay. So how do we show this is by using a mathematical quantity called curl, a vector quantity. Who's heard of curl before? This is so easy. You guys have seen the math. Usually I have to end up teaching the math. Okay, so basically, if the function has any curl, then it's not conservative, and if the curl is equal to zero, it is conservative. Great, so we can skip the next 10 minutes, right? All right, let's go ahead into the curl anyway. But, so, this is usually easy to figure out. Condition two, translates to the curl is equal to zero. Um, sorry, the curl of the force, not the potential. You can't take the cross product with the scalar field. That doesn't make sense. Okay. Um, so you guys, I, I will just skip the preliminaries about how you get to the, to the curl, right? But well, I'll talk about it anyway. All right, um, take the curl of F. You take the same vector quantity, the del operator we talked about this morning. You put it through a cross product, <coughs> which we use the determinants, right? So you have x hat, y hat, z hat. Um, del is the d by dx operator, d by dy, and d by dz. Uh, and then you get the forces fx, fy, 
of z. And then we uh, go ahead and take your determinant to figure out what the heck you're talking about. The curl is defined to be d by dy df z by dy minus dfy by d z in x hat. So that comes about d by dy <coughs> of s z minus, why is that a minus? Shouldn't it be a plus? It's always minus. Yeah. It's because of the rule of determinants. Yeah. Oh no, this one's right. This yeah, one's right. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That one's that one. And the other one is d by dz of fy. That one's negative. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Plus, and the y terms are going to be d by dz of fx minus. Yeah, that one should be minus. Did I do it wrong again? Y d by dz of fx. No, the sign. You're outside the sign. Um, between the two, between x and the parentheses. Uh, no, I did that one positive. That's okay if it does a positive because it switches the sign of the end. Yeah, yeah. You got I, I, for some reason, they oh. changed that negative here, and I don't believe in that. That's not <laughs> um, minus d by dx of fz. So, yes, you can put the minus here, and you can flip those two if you prefer. And I guess that's what they, is that what I teach, what they teach in the school years here? Yeah. yeah. In linear, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know. We've established that. And then the last one's going to be d by dx of fy minus d by dy of fx. And that's in z hat. And this is in the y hat. All right. Great. So let's test this on something. Um, let's test it. Uh, looks like in my notes here I've used the electrical force. Sure, why not? Let's do that. So in that case, a force between two charged particles might be uh, equal to uh, your 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, which I'm going to refer to as just k here, times the product of the two charges over r squared and that's in the r hat direction. And it looks like I've written that out as just setting this equal to some constant, k, q, q, uh, and I'm going to do over r cubed times r vector. Remember, this is what I, this is the trick I pulled this morning too, where this is a vector, and you divide it through, and it's, it's really one over r squared in, r hat, in the r hat direction. Okay, um, so in that case, the x component here is going to become dfz so this is going to have we're going to have to you know what why don't we do the same smart trick that we did should have done this morning which is yes you can push through that in cartesian coordinates but if you're smart, you will look on the back page of your book and find out that under the vector calculus laws here, they have curl written in, in coordinates other than Cartesian. In fact, they will have the curl here in spherical polar coordinates, which are what I am interested in. Let's try that. Um, so this is alternate curl. Usually when I go off my notes, when I stop following my notes, it's bad for everybody. So we'll see if this works out this time. All right, so curl in polar coordinates, according to this, is that curl of f should be equal to, um, so there's three different components. There's an r hat component, and these are not symbol. F phi, 
sorry, minus d by d phi of the radial component. Plus, in the theta hat direction, 1 over r sine theta d by d phi of r minus 1 over r d by dr of r times f phi plus a phi hat component, which is 1 over r times the quantity d by dr of sorry r f theta minus d by d theta of f r. Simple, right? Okay. So in our case, it actually is not too bad because any d by d theta or d by d phi term has to be zero, right? Because there's no phi's or thetas in this expression, there's only r's. Yeah? Okay, so for our case, we have d by d theta here, d by d phi here, so the r component is obviously going to be zero. Here we've got a d by d phi component. Let's write out. Well, here we have a d by dr. But it's of r times f of theta. Uh, f of phi, I'm sorry. And f phi is also zero, right? There's only a radial force here. There are no other components. So this is going to go to zero. So the theta component is also zero. Here we have a d by d theta. No theta components. And here we have a d by dr of f theta. Once again, these are not. Um, there's a, you can do d by dr, but f of theta is zero because there's only radial components here. So this goes to zero. So in this case, the curl of a purely radial force like the one um, shown by uh, Coulomb's law is going to be equal to zero. So you'll be relieved to hear that you can't turn an elect move an electron around in a circle and generate infinite amounts of energy. Uh, otherwise, we'd have, we'd have been on to that. Pretty sure someone would, would, someone would have tried to make money off that. OK, so this means that the electrical force is a conservative force. And because it only depends on position, it doesn't depend on, um, the, on time or the velocity, and because the curl is equal to zero. So this is just a general test. You can do this. Whatever dastardly force I give you, you can test to see whether it's conservative, not by having to go through every possible path or even just two possible paths to show they're different. You can just use the curl. So let's try that on the weird force that we had this morning, right? Um, all right, they told me not to use green. This doesn't show up on the video, so we'll go purple. Okay. Recall the first the force we looked at this morning was um, the x component was equal to y, the y component was equal to 2x, and the z component was equal to 0. Okay, so let's take the curl of that and see if it comes out. Is this a conservative force or not? So when you take the curl of that, what are we going to get? Okay, now we're going to have to use the uh, Cartesian version, but that's okay. The Cartesian version is well suited to this. I don't want to use the polar on this on, on this because we have we, we have a bunch of Cartesian coordinates. Okay, so the x component dfz dy is equal to zero. Zero because fz is equal to zero, right? There's no fz. <coughs> so this is going to be equal to zero minus dfy dz. Fy also zero, so this one's easy. Okay, the x component is zero. The y component, dfx by dz, this doesn't have any z components. 
Similarly, dfz by dx is also going to end up 0. Hey, maybe this is going to be conservative after all. <coughs> it will not. Okay. Here's where it falls down. dfy by dx. Okay, so fy by dx is going to be equal to 2, right? fy dx, okay. Then dfx by dy is going to be equal to 1. So 2 minus 1, you have a number 1 in the z hat direction. So because there is a net curl in this function, it's not conservative, which we showed with much greater difficulty, I think, this morning on that curved linear path. Mm -hmm. That was a mess. Mm -hmm. Just do this. Do the curl. You'll be able to tell whether it's conservative or not. OK. Complications. We said this works if the potential is not a function of time. What if it is a function of time? Let's look at that. Okay. Um, it's possible that you can have a non conservative force but still have the force be equal to the negative gradient of the potential. So if the potential is a function of time, then it's not conservative. You can go around different paths because the potential is changing. You can chase your potential around and you can potentially, uh, you will definitely for sure have different uh, amounts take different amounts of work to get between two different points depending on how long it takes to get there, for instance, right? Um, or how fast you're going, uh, which will translate to how long it takes to get there because of the time variable uh, aspect of the potential. But um, this is still true. You can still have the force be the negative gradient of the potential at any given time, this can, can still be true, even though it isn't always true. Um, so if you're going to do um, the, you're going to go off toward uh, gradient land now, though, you have to go, because now things are changing with time, too, this gets a little hairy, OK? So if you want to take the full derivative, some full derivative with respect to the potential, it's going to be equal to x components, y components, z components, and then a time component as well. You get the partial with respect to t times d. Okay. So this was just what we talked about before. So this is the change in potential just going to be equal to, because this is, the, this is the same as the gradient of the potential, that's equal to the negative force. So this is equal to the negative f. This part is the, the gradient. The dx, dy, dz becomes dotted into dr plus this time component, which is going to get in our way. Recall that this is very similar to um, basically, so the amount, the change in potential is going to be equal to the negative of the amount of work. So this is effectively the amount of work being done, not the work being done on it, plus the change with respect to time. So if you take the full kinetic energy plus the potential energy, you want to see how that's changing with time. Recall the change in the big uh, T is going to be equal to dt, change in kinetic energy with, over time, which we showed was equal to the amount of work you've done on it, according to the work 
potential energy theorem, which is plus f dot dr. So I'm going to replace this with that. It becomes plus f dot dr minus f dot dr plus du dt. So the total change in energy of the system since these cancel. Kinetic plus potential just depends on this changing potential. So when would you ex encounter a changing potential like this? Or if you had like um, a charged wire or something, right? And you were changing the charge in the wire as a function of time. If we're changing sinusoidally or something like that, okay? So you have a capacitor or something and you're, cha you're charging it or discharging it. The total energy is no longer conserved, okay? Because you're changing the potential. However, if you just account for the changing potential, you can still figure out uh, the total change in energy might not be conserved, but you can figure out how much it's not conserved by if you have to. And then figure out um, set the total difference equal to that as opposed to E equal to zero. This also says, though, if the potential isn't changing, then the total kinetic plus potential energy is conserved. Duh, which you guys saw that in Physics 211. Right? So who, who had Physics 211 with me? It was Gunner and Lachlan, who's not here. Okay. Who did the rest of you guys see to Physics 211 from? You saw it from Mark, I guess, down in, in CSI. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yevgen. Yevgen? Hedman. Which one? Uh, Hedman. Hedman. UK? You Chang? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you must have taken a couple years ago then? Yes. I think he hasn't taught for a while, okay. Who did you take? Different university. Different university, where were you at? Columbia Basin College. Is that in? Pasco, Washington. Say it again, Pasco? Yeah. Okay, okay. Who did you take it from? Bourbon. <clears throat> Sorry. Bourbon. Bourbon? I think I North Idaho College. North Idaho College, so did you take it from Casey? No. The other guy? Thompson. Okay. Did you take anything from Casey? No, too bad. She was my student, so she was my graduate student, so that's my like the one person I know around here. Mm -hmm. So does she just not teach the intro classes? Does she teach other stuff, or maybe I don't know. I don't know. Okay, okay, fair enough. Um, so you guys have a quite different background. That's really interesting. Um, we'll have to see how that. Um, what, you know, what position that puts everybody in. But it's interesting, because usually, I mean, I would expect that everyone would have taken Physics 211 at the same time, and everybody comes into this having taken the same course, but that's like totally not true, so that's really interesting. There you go, all right. Um, let's look at um, the total energy, then, in um, simple systems. So we're gonna start with one-dimensional systems, um, but we you can sort of expand this out, but it gets a little hairy. Okay. Uh, okay, so if the total energy is fixed, total amount of energy E, okay, then one half mv squared plus the potential is equal to that total energy. You can use this to derive what your velocity would have to be at any position in the field, okay? So if for an arbitrary u we can just solve this for v, this is going to become E minus u over there, one half mv squared over here. We're solving for the V. So let's solve for V squared first. E minus U is going to be equal to M over 2. We'll take the square root of that. So the velocity should be equal to the square root of 2 over M times the square root of E, the total energy minus U, the total potential. Um, and here I've added u is a function of x, so u is a function of position, right? So this is really useful when you're solving uh, 
the problem. You're on this, uh, so you're on a roller coaster or something, right? It's got some loop to loop. It's got some crazy path. Ooh, it looks like I'd make me bark right there. Um, if you know how much energy you start with, you can then derive, this would be as a function of y, uh, right? You can derive how fast you should be going at any given point, assuming there's no friction. <laughs> don't draw, don't, make sure you try, try this with test dummies before you put um, any people in your uh, roller coaster. Um, but, right, you can imagine that trying to integrate how much work gravity is doing on this as a function of time would be a nightmare, right? No one wants to do that. Um, whereas if you just use the total energy, you can derive directly how fast it should be going, modulo of plus or minus out here, um, owing to these square roots, right? You can't tell whether you're going one way or say this comes up over here, right? You could be going another way. You could be going the opposite direction. It just tells you how much energy you have. Uh, so this only tells you your speed. It only tells you the magnitude of the velocity. It doesn't really tell you your direction. What if you want to find how long it takes you to get between two points. I know this is kind of a scattershot lecture, right? A, we're doing a whole bunch of different random things, but that's where we're at, okay. So if velocity equals, is equal to dx dt, we want to figure out how long it takes to get to get between any two points. Um, let's go ahead and solve this for t. Um, dt is equal to one over v. I'm going to put this over here, right? Dx. And if you integrate both sides here, the total time is going to be equal to the integral of one over v dx between the starting point and the ending point. And if you plug in this horrible velocity, you can directly figure out what that should be. Time should be x naught to x1, and that velocity is going to be now that m's over m over 2. I can put that up front. Times 1 over the square root of e minus the potential dx. So this is actually um, a neat trick, uh, which is to figure out how long it takes to get you along that roller coaster, which is otherwise like kind of hard to figure out, right? Otherwise, you'd have to figure out, you'd have to know the velocity at each individual point, and you'd have to like integrate it, I guess, numerically. Of course, this doesn't help you that much. You're still probably going to have to integrate this numerically. Unless it's falling in a straight line, in which case you wouldn't need to do anything this crazy complicated anyway, right? So why bother? But you'll find that while in classes like this, most of the things I show you have this nice, neat, analytical answer. And you think, oh, so everything in life, right, comes out with a nice, neat, analytical answer. That is not true. The stuff we show you in here is like particularly biased toward coming out easy on a board in 10 minutes in a way that real problems that you encounter as a real physicist are not. So numerically integrating something like this is something that we do. That's just what you do as a real physicist. Because in general, you got something complicated going on. It's not a simple case. Now, that's not to say that the analytical versions aren't really helpful. It turns out when you're doing your numerical integration, like if you want to make sure it's right, you should probably test it against you know, an analytical case to start with to make sure it gets the right answer in that case. Um, and we'll always have our crazy, complicated numerical programs. We always compare them against known end members that do have analytical solutions, and this is why it can be really helpful. The other reason it can be helpful is that the numerical version might get you a more accurate answer, but it doesn't tell you, say, I mean, how will the total amount of time to get to another point vary with, say, what the total energy is? It's kind of hard to tell in many cases. In this case, you can just look at it directly. It's like inversely proportional to the total energy. Square root of the total energy. 
So going faster will get you there. Uh, having more energy will get you there faster, but not linearly, right? It'll get you there as the one over the square root. And that kind of insight is also really hard to glean from um, a numerical solution in many cases. Um, this next bit's really boring. Let's just skip it. We're going to do this later. Yeah, forget it. Too boring. All right. Let's do, the, let's just do this example I have at the back because I know this is going to take me longer than I think. So an eminently practical problem online. It's obviously not a practical problem We're in a physics class. But <laughs> If you have a box on a speed bump, who hasn't tried to put a box on a speed bump to figure out what's going to happen? You know, I mean, you think about physics, you think really practical problems. All right, so we got a speed bump. I'm going to put a box on the speed bump. Excellent. Very practical. Um, actually, let me draw this a little bit differently so it'll be easier to measure the angles. happens. Okay. The question is, when you put the box on the speed bump, is it stable or is it going to fall off? And here's how we're going to figure it out. Recall from Physics 211 that we talk about different kinds of equilibria, stable equilibria, unstable equilibria, and neutral equilibria. Remember that? Who remembers that? Who does not remember that? Okay, so we have not seen that. Let's talk about that. Okay. So if you were to plot out, in general, a potential as a function of position against that position, let's say um, you have a relatively high potential over here and a relatively lower potential over there, and it kind of looks like this, okay? So here's your potential. It's a function of position. What does the force look like at every point here? Recall that the force is equal to the negative gradient of the potential. Or in one dimension, it's just the derivative of the potential. OK? But it's the negative derivative. OK? So at places where the slope is 0, the force is zero. At places where the, the force um, goes this way, so the slope is going this way, so the slope is positive here, but the force is equal to the negative slope. So at places where the slope is positive, the force is negative. It's going to pull you back in this other direction. In places where the slope is negative, the force which is the negative of the slope, is going to be positive. It's going to pull you back this way. Okay. So what I love about potential plots like this is I've just described this very complicated way, <coughs> but it's really simple to figure out what's going to happen. Just imagine that this is a roller coaster and you put a marble on it. Okay. Where is it going to go? It's going to go this direction. If you put a marble over here, where is it going to go? You can figure out the negative gradient of the potential, but if you plot out the potential as a function of position like this, this equation boils down to just imagine that your actual potential is just mgh, and you put a marble there, and what's it going to do? Which direction is it going to be pushed? So it's not as hard as it looks. An equilibrium point is one at which the force is equal to 0. So you might be able to get something to say there, right? If you put a marble here, what's it going to do? It's going to go nowhere, OK? It's going to be a stable point. If you put a marble here, what's it going to do? Well, technically, it's at a flat point there. The slope is 0. So it's going to go nowhere, 
but you can tell that there's a very <coughs> there's a really big difference between this equilibrium point and this one, right? If you put the marble here, what's going to do over long term? It's going to stay there. In fact, if you knock the marble a little bit, what's it going to do? If you knock this marble a bit over this way, it's going to go up the hill and it's going to get pushed back here, and then it's going to get pushed back here, but it's going to stick around this equilibrium point. This is a stable equilibrium. This marble, unless you have it exactly, unless you've exactly balanced your pencil on the pencil lead and managed to get it to stay there, this is an unstable equilibrium. Once you get some random air molecule in the room that knocks this a little bit in one direction, it's going to roll off in that direction. This is called an unstable equilibrium here. Shoot, I'm writing in, I'm writing in green. You guys can't see this crap. Oh well. Um, hopefully, you already saw this in Phys 211. If um, there's another kind of equilibrium where if you just have a totally flat area. This is called a neutral equilibrium, right? Because if you have a marble here, it's not going to go anywhere. But if you knock it in a little in one direction, it's not going to come back to the equilibrium point. But neither is it going to like roll off forever. It's just going to continue in a straight line. So this is a neutral equilibrium. OK. Mathematically, how do you find an equilibrium? An equilibrium point is where the derivative of the potential is equal to zero. Okay, so i.e., the force is equal to zero. Right? How do you tell if it's a stable, an unstable, or a neutral equilibrium? Well, you take the second derivative of the potential. If this is greater than 0, right, the second derivative is greater than 0, then you have an upwardly expanding parabola. That's a stable equilibrium. If it's equal to 0, that's neutral. And if it's less than 0, that's an unstable equilibrium. OK. So when we put the box on the speed bump, the question is, is it going to fall off? The way we're going to calculate that is first we're going to determine, is there a stable equilibrium? Or first of all, is there an equilibrium? Sorry, where and where is it? And once we find the equilibrium, we're going to determine, is it stable or unstable? All right. This is part of the problem with physics 211 is that some classes do, you know, some instructors to teach different things, um, which is fine, but we're going to catch you all up here. That's part of what we're doing. Okay. In order to do that, we're going to have to figure out what the potential energy of this box is. That's the whole problem. Basically, this is the hard part. We're going to calculate u as a function of theta where theta, yeah, it's going to be this point where it touches here, theta. Not the point where the center is, but the point where it touches. So where it's tangent to the surface? Right, where it's touching the surface. OK? And that's a little tricky, and that's what's going to get us uh, into trouble if we're not careful. So right, the total potential of the box up here is just going to be equal to m G H. OK, we're done. That was easy, right? Uh, OK. What's H? <laughs> That's complicated. Well, it's the height of the center of mass of the box. OK. Well, what's that equal to? Let's take the radius of the speed bump here to be R. And the size of half of the box here 
we'll call B. Okay? Now, what's H? What's the height? We're going to talk about it as three different segments together. We're going to talk about this, plus this, plus this. The height of the first segment is going to be r times the cosine of theta. Right, so if theta equals zero, it's just going to be equal to r. The height would be equal to r. But you know, if this were to totally roll off over here, h would um, theta would be all the way down here, and it would, would no longer be high at all. It wouldn't have any potential energy. So that's going to be r cosine theta. And similarly, this is going to be r cosine or b cosine theta. All right. That wasn't bad so far. What's this distance? Can you give me another triangle? I think it's equal to, right, if you start it at the middle, it's going to rock over. It's gonna, this distance is going to be equal to the arc length along here, okay, which is. r times theta. So this distance here is r theta. But of course, that's the distance. What height does it add? Well, if you're up here, it adds 0. If you're down here, it's going to add r theta. So it's r theta times sine theta. OK, that was the hard part. The rest of this is not hard. OK, so in order to figure out is this a stable equilibrium or not? Or first of all, where are the equilibria? Let's take the derivative with respect to u. So du d theta, derivative of u with respect to theta. And we're going to get r plus b times, what's the derivative of cosine? Negative sine? Negative sine. Yeah. What's the derivative of this? I think we're going to have to go all uh, product rule on it. So that's going to be equal to r theta times the derivative of sine theta, which is cosine theta, plus r sine theta times the derivative of theta, which is 1. OK? Yeah. OK, if you set that equal to 0, is that where I have my notes? Wow, it is. OK. Every once in a while, things come through. OK, so what I do here next is, let's simplify this a bit. We have a minus r sine theta and a plus r sine theta. So those will just cancel. We've got a minus b sine theta plus r theta cosine theta. I think that's all that's left. Yeah. Except that I forgot the mg out front. That's a constant, so just pretend there's an mg. So you set that equal to zero. When is this equal to zero? Well, first think about it. When should the box balance? Theta equals zero. So let's see if that's true. At theta equals zero, sine theta. 0. Cosine theta is 1, though. But, the but it's theta. multiplied by theta. So now it's 0. So there is an equilibrium. There's an equilibrium at theta equals 0. So you can go back, tell your, your um, history roommates that, wow, in physics today, we did this thing really awesome. We tried to, fu tried to figure out how to balance a box on a speed bump. And it turns out, if you have it exactly on top, it's balanced. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> All right, but we did it with math. So that's why that makes it double awesome. But is it a stable equilibrium? Is your box going to fall off? Let's find out. Take the second derivative with respect to theta.
All right, let's do that. All right, uh, we got a negative b, derivative of sine. Is cosine. Okay, so negative b, cosine theta. And we're going to have to product rule this again. Minus r theta sine theta. Minus r theta sine theta because derivative of cosine is minus sine plus r cosine theta. Yeah, right? Yeah. Okay. R minus B, right? R plus R minus B times cosine theta minus R theta sine theta. Okay, so we're going to evaluate this at the equilibrium point. At theta equals zero, what's this equal to? This term is going to be zero times zero. It's going to be like hella zero. So that's the mathematical term for that concept. <laughs> this cosine is going to go to one, in which case the second derivative is going to be equal to r minus b. So is that positive? negative or zero? Well, it depends. Ah, so we did get an interesting result after all. Okay, according to this result, if r is greater than b, so if the speed bump is bigger than the box, the second derivative is positive, and that yields a stable equilibrium. If, on the other hand, you Get, try to put a big ass box on the speed bump where the box is bigger than the speed bump, b is bigger than r, now this becomes negative and that's an unstable equilibrium. Okay, so your homework, should you choose to accept it, will be to find some sort of box. Are there speed bumps on campus? There must be. I don't even know. Surely there are. No? How can there be no speed bumps on campus? We totally need one. Where are there some? Usually end up being the light posts that people run into at night. That's that's the that's the, the what, what governs speed around the university. All right, shoot. Well, we might not be able to solve this, but you can also solve this if you just have like a pipe. You just have a pipe sitting there. If you have a pipe and like a die or something, as long as the die is smaller than the pipe, the size is smaller. You should be able to balance it on top, and it should be able to stay. Whereas if you take a Rubik's Cube and you try to put it on the pipe, it should fall off, I think. So try to see if you can actually demonstrate this um, and see if, this is, see if our math um, is correct or not and see if you can um, use all this math for good and not just figuring out that, yeah, you can sort of balance a box on a speed bump if you just put it in the middle. Yeah. So if you're going to go to a beach and balance rocks, assuming, say, you can find like perfect On each other. Yeah, pure, perfectly cubical rocks. Yes. Or spherical. Or yeah. spherical rocks. Yes. On a spherical rock. Then you have to start with real big rock. And go to smaller. Small right. Rocks. If you if at any time you go a bigger one over a smaller one, it's not gonna work. it shouldn't work. I think it's going to fall over. But we figured out with the math. OK. Uh, your homework on this chapter is due Friday, I think. So I know that's a little soon, um, but hopefully you guys have enough time. Let me know, as always, if you need an extension. And we'll start in on chapter five on Wednesday. See you then.